Hello, everybody. This is your host, Aram Kumuf, and you're listening to another episode of the Product Innovation Series, uh, where every week on our show, we get guests come on and share their stories and wisdom on how to ship a great product. Uh, today, I'm joined by Ahmed Kadim, a.k.a. AK, <laughs> recently, who was uh, the head of product at Time Saved, uh, a Toronto-based startup. And he's also a veteran of three different marketplace startups, oh, uh, Aquamobile. Activate. Oh, fuck. All yeah. right. <laughs> uh, let me change that then so I don't screw that up again. It's just Activate? Yeah, okay. the full name will be Activate Staff, but just refer to it as Activate. All right, let me change it everywhere else. My bad. I'm probably going to do it as well. So, (laughs) (laughs) all right, let's let's do this again. (laughs) All right, cut. (laughs) All right. Hello, everybody. This is your host, Aram Mukumuf, and you're listening to another episode of the Product Innovation Series, where every week uh, we have guests come on our show and share their stories and wisdom on how to ship a great product. Uh, today, I'm joined by Ahmed Kadim, uh, also known as AK, uh, recently as a head of product at Activate, and he's also been a veteran of three other marketplace startups, um, Aquamobile, Hashtag Paid, and 500px. Ahmed, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks so much, Aaron. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. So the first question I have for you is, working in, in product or being a product leader, um, you have to work you know, pretty closely with sales teams and customer success. Um, so from your kind of uh, experience, how do you go about properly collaborating with those two types of uh, departments or you know, teams? Yeah, great question. For me at Activate, that's where I really learned how to do this, uh, you know, for the for the first time. Working closely with sales was a huge thing there because we were building a, a product that agencies can deploy to their clients and their workers. So it's a three-sided network. And what that means is that there's so much resistance to adopting this because it's really changing their entire business. And so I couldn't just go build a product and then let the salespeople kind of try to figure that out. I was, I was there in the sales calls, you know, working with those early customers, reassuring them that the roadmap was going to match what they needed long term. And along the sales team itself, you know, there's, there's this constant flow of information where they're feeding talking points that have done well for them back to me. So I can start to understand, like, where does product market fit lie from here directionally? You know, am I, am I in the right direction at all or is this not landing and that that kind of constant input was really important Mm -hmm. Uh, eventually we we, you know created some systems we started kind of teaching each other as much as we could about our disciplines so you know we could collaborate more effectively that way okay and uh just out of curiosity uh at activate was it more of a sales driven kind of product culture or was it or were you trying to become more of a product-led growth kind of mindset company? Uh, not product-led growth because there's no way to just have it be used by a subset of their workers. It really had to be something that's part of their digital transformation. And the founder, CEO, Rohan, he, you know, he has a sales background. So it started off, I think, very sales-led. But w- when I joined, then it was kind of balancing it out to say, we also have a vision for where the industry is going. And if we only listen to what customers are saying, you know, give us this least list of features, they're going to lead us astray if we're not careful. So it, it kind of became a good balance between sales and product. Okay. And uh, when you were listening to all those kind of uh, uh, sales calls that were happening with, with the client partners, you're probably getting a lot of different ideas, different directions. How do you as a product leader, you know, centralize or analyze and create some sort of next steps on all the information you you were getting? Yeah, we we iterated through a bunch of different ways to do this, but eventually landed on one that was that was easy, that was fast, and and then worked when we actually needed to make decisions. And that's to have a single database in, we used Notion, but you you can do it in Airtable or whatever. Uh, And then we called it customer problems and goals. And this was something that the design team, the product team, sales, customer success, everyone is adding to this as they're talking to people. And we tag, you know, which customer or prospect had this problem or goal, and then that starts to accumulate. And you start to see that, you know, for example, uh, you know, we need to do a background check on nurses before we can hire them. And that should be 
after we've made uh, you know a, a tentative offer but before they actually go to work and so that type of problem is something that we learned how to tag as a problem is something that you're already doing something and it's hard to do it it's it's difficult something's getting in your way a goal is something you're not already doing but wouldn't it be nice if you could do that thing that, that would change your business that would improve your efficiency and so even just that as a shared language made it much easier to work with sales especially when you know they're coming off a pro, you know prospect demo call and they're saying hey you know they really liked it but they wanted a b c d features and uh, can we do that and instead of asking you know can we do these features it's letting them understand that every time you know a customer is asking for a feature generally there is a problem or goal behind that request and if we can understand that problem or goal in just a little bit more detail we're going to make a much better recommendation a lot of the time about how we can solve it and so it's it's just learning to think about it that way and at the point of contact with the customer if that's the sales call the demo call the the customer success call always knowing how to ask those questions back to the customer instead of having this sort of long round trip where can we do x feature why do we need x feature let's go back and ask them okay now we've asked them they said this but wait what do they really mean by that and if you're going to have these round trips it's just never going to work so that's why it's so important for anyone who's talking to customers or prospects to know how, how to ask those questions get that insight awesome and if you were to kind of um go back or you know i'm not sure what's what stage everything was at when you when you joined activate but as a product leader or as like head of product as yourself running product in a company like that or even as a founder which in, in this case is is rohan what can you do what kind of effective steps or um activities can you do in order to make sure you get your first customer right that's a you know, really good question it was so important for us because in the in the type of product we were building each agency each customer was a very large contract with a you know potentially thousands tens of thousands of workers and so unlike maybe a lot of b2b or SaaS companies where you know you, you can line up one two ten fifty customers uh pretty quickly you know here it was something where our first year we had one or two customers, you know, mm -hmm. and you're working really closely with them to build out the platform. So who that first customer is in our case was way more important than, than you know, the, the average because we didn't have a lot of customers to ask. And if we started with, with one that was asking for a bunch of things that would end up only really being applicable for them, you know, now we've dug ourselves into a hole where we can't sell this thing to anyone else. And so we needed to understand the process where you know who is that first active customer and do they know that like this is really a partnership that this is something where we are going to solve your problems but we can't just build custom software for you do they you know do they see the the long-term trajectory that we're on and understand you know where and when we're going to hit those milestones that they're looking for and to be patient with us to give us feedback not to expect you know everything to be perfect on day one but for that to be you know something that they see as a long-term investment into transforming their business and to the to the extent that you know some customers are just going to give you a feature list and if you start asking questions and trying to get insight we noticed with a couple of those early customers they didn't take to that very well because they felt like they were being challenged or confronted and they're saying you know hi i'm, I'm the customer i want these features can you do them or not and if you i want a yes or no answer then you know they might not say it in exactly those words but that, that's what they're implying and every time we tried to have a conversation it all, to them it felt like we were confronting them with, with other early customers if we asked for insight for you know having a conversation doing some more research talking to their recruiters uh, that some customers got excited by that and we were you know thinking hey none of my other tech vendors talk to my team no one's ever asked me to do that before that's really interesting you seem to really care about the you know the, the problem you seem to be very curious and making sure that this is going to work for us and it's just looking for the people who can you know who, who get that that's really interesting you mentioned that because uh we as a product studio come across those situations the people who are open to the confrontation and are okay when we ask why are the ones who feel like they have more value working mm -hmm. with us 
others like who are like why are you challenging me and i'm like well I'm trying to help you build a better product so you're more <laughs> successful like stop being stupid and listen you know <laughs> um wanted to ask you something about you know early on building a company or building working on an early stage product where you have one key customer you know as you were saying just um a few moments mm -hmm. ago how did you overcome any of the shortfalls you know pitfalls when you are too focused in or uh, you know zoned in on one specific client versus trying to build out something uh, that would be more applicable to maybe uh, you know other clients so you're not uh, mm -hmm. hindering you know that type of potential yeah I think we you know we, we didn't do such a great job at this in the beginning but what we learned to do was have an ongoing user research with prospects so that if you know our sample size is 10 prospects and one active customer then of course we're prioritizing what that active customer is asking for but every time they're asking for something that we're a little iffy on that we're not sure if this is going to be valuable we have a roster of other people to reach out to and their value in, in being on the line for that type of question is that if one day they are interested in buying our product that they're going to you know see that it's already being customized for them in advance and that was a bit of a trojan horse sales tactic as well where you don't go to them asking for the sale or asking to start discovery right away you go to them asking if you can you know ask them some more questions can i talk to some people on your team can i ask your clients for a little bit of feedback about you know if they could do this would that help them and the types of prospects that would let you do that often ended up converting to customers at a later stage and then you've already taken their needs into account awesome all right next question uh being a product i think you have a background in design as well uh even i think development from what i saw and now you know being a, um, a head of product what are some bad recommendations you hear in product across the board I think one is adherence to frameworks and just sticking to a framework and saying like that, that's how we do things. We, we, we do things in a lean way or we do things in the, um, you know, following the zero to one methodology or which, whichever it is. To me, I see those all as just part of a toolkit based on the scenario that is in front of you. You know, what team members do you have? What are they used to? what stage of product are you building is it is it an iterative product is it a zero to one type product or whatever it is you're building uh, you know learning to zoom out and see that there's a, many frameworks available and that they're then also something that you should adapt to your scenario not something you should just take off the shelf and stick to yeah it's very true don't don't get lost in the different frameworks uh people tend to uh like for example, like uh, some of the people we work with, they say to us they work agile, but uh, it's not really agile. It's like safe or you know, still waterfall or some hybrid form. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, any other ones that you uh, can think of? One I find maybe it kind of follows a little bit on that is people w rushing to build something as the only way that you could possibly learn if this is going to work or not and i tend to take issue with that i think you know, that really discounts the value of good user research that really discounts the value of having a model of your problem having a model of your customers problems your goals and what ecosystem are you fitting into before you build anything I feel like that saved me a bunch of problem, like a bunch of uh, you know lost time, mm -hmm. where if I had just jumped to let's build something and see what happens, that ultimately we would have spent like months of development just to learn it doesn't work when we probably could have figured that out earlier. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Um, next question I have is: Throughout your career, uh, did you have any big wake up call moments, uh, which made you really change the way you think or do something? Yeah, so at Activate, after the first year where I was really focused on execution, product design, and building out the team, but I wasn't talking to our customers more than, you know, sp sporadically. And I wasn't taking the attitude that customer success was as critical to our product success as the actual 
product itself, that the time you spend with the customer is guiding them, providing resources, especially in something that is part of their digital transformation strategy, this big change management thing that they have to you know, take their entire team of 50 people and get them to work this new way, that I really discounted the value of customer success until I started to hear from one of our customers that kind of explained, here's what our other tech vendors who have been good at this have done and you're not doing. And I was like, oh, okay, you're absolutely right. Like we're not doing that. We kind of always thought we'll get there, we'll hire that customer success team and we'll, we'll do those things eventually. But then we're just failing and we're not understanding like why are we failing so much? And it's really that we hand the, the product over, we've solved their needs in, in purely in feature terms but they're not investing the time to figure it out. And their agencies often have a mixture of tech backwards, tech forwards people. And so you might only get you know 10% of their team adopting it. And that they feel is not worth it if only su such a low percentage are working with it. So we learn to get very hands-on, very manual, You know, do things that don't scale in, in the words of Paul Graham to get that early adoption. And what that meant was looking down to the individual user level who's using this product actively, call them, hey, what, what value are you getting out of it? Who's not using this product that we think should be by now? Call them, hey, what's preventing you from using this? And you know, I started spending half my time on customer success. And I think that's something you know, that was counterintuitive for me and may, might still be counterintuitive for a lot of product leaders at a very early stage when you don't have that CS team yeah. built out is, is how much value you can get out of doing it yourself. Yeah, it's very aligned to, I'm sure you heard of this, the concept of, of something called continuous discovery, uh, which mm -hmm. came from um, a product leader named Teresa Torres, where she's basically saying you should be, you know, spending half your week or one week in discovery, another week in development, and you're mm -hmm. constantly kind of just feeding the loop where you're constantly testing and listening and asking mm -hmm. questions to the users. Um, but like what I hear a lot is that... Uh, you're right. Like you know, you could get too funneled. You know, you could have too much tunnel vision in terms of something, and then it's only until when somebody brings it up, like how you mentioned there with like those those client partners, like hey, you know, you're not doing this. Um, so it's it's tricky, right? Like managing your time. But all the successful mm -hmm. products I think we've worked on, or you know, we've we've come across, are ones that the product leaders spend most of the time just talking and listening to to the customers. Mm -hmm. And what have you become? better at saying no to over the years feature requests <laughs> okay <laughs> i mean in, in the early days I, I felt the pressure especially when there, you know there wasn't a ton of customers to say yes to every feature request because right. there's that risk of losing your your primary customer there's that risk of um you're not in such a position of strength at that point and you're not even confident that what you're doing is working so there was that pressure to please and i think over time, I started to get better at saying no to those feature requests, along with an explanation, along with you know a soft no with a reasoning or why it might come later, what else it's tied to, what dependencies that comes along with. And so giving someone a really robust system to understand your no and how, how are you coming to that no uh, that you know, as it comes to a feature request. And that could be you know, not just customers, it could be anyone on your team and anyone else. Okay, awesome. Um, if you could only work five hours per week, what would you want to do when it comes to a uh, product? What would you want to focus your five hours a week on? I really like just being in like a kind of build space with my team. So, you know, I consider myself uh, like Shreyas has this great, uh, uh, you know, three types of product leaders. And he says there's the operator, the craftsperson, and the visionary. And I think between those three, I find myself identifying most closely with the craftsperson. And maybe that's where my front-end development design background also comes into play, where I can, I can jump into code with engineers, I can jump into Figma with designers, and get to really great creative ideas that way, things that are you know, unintuitive or not so straightforward. Um, that's what I would spend my five hours doing is just being in that building space together with everyone. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, any controversial views you hold when it comes to building product? Yeah. So 
I've come to the belief in the last few weeks that community managers, especially in Web3 products, are going to become as important, if not more, than a product manager in Web2. I think product management emerged as this role that became so critical in large tech companies to connect the user to the business, to the actual resources, the team, the ability to execute, and bringing those together in one role made a lot of sense to accelerate and amplify your team. I think in, in Web3 with the community first development, and of course there's examples of this in, in, in not just in Web3, but you know, starting with the community of people that you're building for and understanding them, being part of them, um, in some cases doing things that don't scale, like just having uh, Twitter spaces with people that you're serving. And for a community manager, then I think right now they're seen as someone who you know, just keeps people happy, is nice to talk to. But I think what's going to happen is the community manager is going to play this key role in building the community and then understanding them in such a way that you can then understand what types of products and services can we build for that community. Mm -hmm. I'm really, it's really interesting you mentioned that. And we're working on a Web3 project where the community management part is going to be critical. But for me, I'm trying to see what would what would you say is the difference between a community manager and a product marketer mm, that's a really good question I, i'd say that this difference is going to evolve rapidly because the community management role is changing so fast but that a product marketer is understanding the audience but it is an audience and that's not the same thing as a community where the community might be contributing. They mm -hmm. might be anywhere between full-time to part-time to invested in your company. And there's all these different stakes and the time that they're spending together is much more than just being an audience member, receiving a message, or seeing an advertisement, and looking at a landing page. They're not participating very much in that way. And I think that's the big difference. Okay, uh, that's, good. that's a good point. Um, just a few more. The next three are more like personal. So what, what, what prof profession, other than what uh, you do now, would you like to attempt? I always thought being an architect would be a lot of fun. Okay. Because I really like to think about the physical environment, and I don't do any of that in my work. <laughs> Maybe I should go work on some hardware. But yeah, being an architect would be so much fun. Okay, cool. Uh, what's been one of the most uh, worthwhile investments you've made uh, uh, to date in your personal development? I think for me, I've hopped around uh, from being a developer to being a designer to being a product manager often in early stage startups where even if those are my titles, but I'm also doing a bunch of other things as well. I'm doing some sales, some marketing, I'm doing a little bit of customer success, I'm doing well, all of the different roles. And I think that if my, if my trajectory was very linear to just get as far as I can in one direction, then that would be the wrong thing to do. But by spreading myself you know, across all of these different roles, I think ultimately I get very creative ideas about how to kind of integrate these different specializations, integrate these different disciplines. And I'd call that like an investment in my long-term future because it sets me up for short-term. People are like, we don't get what you do. Why, you know, <laughs> what is your role here? And, you know, why, well, why, should we, why should we bring you on for this uh, leadership product position if you've done all these other things along the way? And I, I feel that's that long-term investment where understanding all of those things, being able to think freely and collaborate effectively with, with all those different team members. Um, that, that, that's like the, the biggest investment, I'd say, that I've I made on myself. Awesome. Okay. Uh, last question, uh, AK. What are one to three books or whatever you could think off the top of your head that have greatly influenced uh, your life, uh, whether that's personal or you know professional related? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. I think the one, the one I placed right in front of me for a reason is Sapiens, because it really helps me just zoom out and understand like on the long scale of human history, how we got here and, and what humanity, you know, at its core can be capable of all the diversity of culture that is possible. 
And I, I really love that book for just helping me zoom out and see the big picture, especially when we're rethinking the way the world works. It's kind of nice to remember that it hasn't worked this way for very long. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, I'll ch- I've never heard of that book, but I'll check it out. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's great. That was, that's a wrap. Thank you so much, uh, AK, for coming on and sharing your uh, wealth of knowledge and experience. So and also thank you to always to our listeners for tuning in. Uh, but uh, yeah, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, AK. Thank you.